So as you know, I'm going to talk very similar to what Brian was talking about, how we can change our cities to make them more uh, habitable, more where, where well-being is an important factor and where we connect with nature again, because in many cities people are disconnected with nature and I think that ethnobotany can play a key role to get this connection going. So what is ethnobotany? Ethnobotany is a science that studies the relations between people and plants. Ethno means ethnography is the study of people, of culture, and botany is the study of plants. So ethnobotany is this symbiosis between uh, ethnography and botany. And ethnobiology is usually study this combination of knowledge, practices, and beliefs that are inside a language matrix. So ethnobotany started in the, it, it was given a name by late 19th century, although uh, our relation with plants has been ever existing, even our ancestors were already practicing ethnobotany. And now the new frontiers of this science involve changes from the rural areas to the urban areas, but also from medicinal plants to food plants. And in addition, we're very interested to in studying how ethnobotany changes, how these processes of plant-people relations evolve through time. So when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking, what made me be interested in ethnobotany and how did I come to end up going back to Barcelona? And I found that I had a circular history. My, my, my history kind of like started in Barcelona and then after 25 years of moving around the world made me go back to this marvelous city. Well, this picture, although looks like Switzerland, it probably looks like Kandersteg, this is where my grandmother grew up in the Pyrenees. And she was the person who introduced me to nature. She was a person who lived uh, amongst cows. She was a cowgirl and she knew a lot about using natural resources. And since I was a kid, I spent lots of time with her learning about nature. Afterwards, when I, uh, in the 90s, I decided to study biology in Barcelona, and I got a chance to go to the United States to study with Lynn Margulis in a program called Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. And there, I understood the importance of symbiosis. Uh, Lynn Margulis was a person who studied ethno, uh, uh, endosymbiosis, and she taught me this importance of merging different sciences. In this case, uh, it was in cell biology, but afterwards it became ethnobotany in my case. So I got a chance to go to Costa Rica, study at the University Nacional. I continued in Costa Rica, working in different institutions, working with indigenous communities. And from there, I went to the United Kingdom to study a PhD in ethnobiology. Afterwards, I went back to Barcelona and started doing the work that I will be presenting you today. So cities are these places where most of humans live and at, at, at present time. More, to, more, more than 50% of the population lives already in cities, and this is going to double by the year 2050. Here we have a map with most of the countries. The uh, light pink, for example, represents countries that are mostly rural, so still most of the population lives in towns. But as we go into the darker uh, purple, uh, we go into countries that have more than 50% of people living in cities, and then we have those yellow-orange countries where uh, people, 75% of the population live in cities. We also have these little bright pink rounds that represent cities with more than 10 million people. So although China, for example, has 42% of people living in cities, has already three cities with more than 10 million people. And we can see this tendency of uh, America and Western Europe with more people in the cities and Africa and Asia going towards that trend, but still with lots of people living in rural areas. So if we look at cities as ecosystems, cities have this ecological side with uh, the green uh, circle, but also have a human side where uh, human interactions occur. And as I was mentioning, ethnobotany tries to bridge these two worlds. And here we, can, we have this uh, diagram showing also how cities combine those two uh, spheres, the biological one and the cultural or human side. So cities are places for lots of challenges, but also lots of opportunities. And 
some of the opportunities that uh, cities have will be explained today. So if we go to Barcelona and see what is the cultural diversity in Barcelona, of the three pe million people that live in Barcelona metropolitan area, about half a million come from countries outside of Spain. Especially, we see here that most of the population in Barcelona comes from South America, all the, of the foreign population, followed by the European Union and a follow after by Asian countries. We see that Africa, Central and North America and other European countries uh, represent lesser numbers. Also, we can see that the highest uh, non-Spanish population are Italians, followed by, pa by Pakistanians and Chinese um, inhabitants, followed by several countries of Latin America, Northern Africa, Europe again, and the Philippines. And if we see also this evolution has been quite fast and quite recent, because in 1991 only 5% of the population was of a foreign country, while by the year 2013 more than 15th of the population was uh, immigrant. So there's been a, a really big increase of population, uh, immigrant population. This was about the cultural aspect of the city, and now I'm going to talk about the more natural or green spaces in the city. Barcelona has a network of different spaces where plants, especially plants, but also animals, live in them. And here we have, in the top of the map, you see the natural park of Barcelona, and then you have little spots where uh, urban parks are located. Several streets are also fully lined with uh, different trees. And also there is a really nice park uh, close to the sea, Montjuic Park, which also has hosts lots of animals and plants. So just in numbers, I have calculated that about a thousand animals and plants live already in Barcelona, be it alive or even in markets, like plants that are eaten. They are not grown in Barcelona, but they end up in the city. So about, it's a, a, also a really big diversity of plants and animals living in Barcelona. So this, for example, is the natural park of Coiserola, which surrounds the city. It's a 8,300 hectare park. It's not very big, but it's quite big and has hosts lots of Mediterranean flora and fauna. So it's a very beautiful park to walk around when you don't want to be in the city for a long time. There are also these other spaces where more human nature interactions occur, such as community gardens. We see here, for example, the big picture on the right is uh, a neighborhood garden. And on the left, we have this really big uh, project that is happening now, Can Masdeu. You can see the city right behind that mountain. So it's, uh, it's this project happening really, really close to the city where, where many people participate in agricultural activities. We also have roof gardens, which are increasing, and I think it's, they have a great potential because the city is filled with buildings with roofs that have nothing on them. And then river banks, we have two rivers in the city, Bazos and Llobregat, and both rivers have in their river banks agricultural land, which is fertile, very fertile. The rivers have been cleaned up during the recent decades. A few years ago they were pretty dirty, but rivers have been increasingly being less polluted. And here we have in the lower uh, right corner this map that shows all the little projects that are occurring in schools, where schools are starting also to grow their own food, not in big amounts, but at least kids are in contact with plants and learn about agriculture. Other spaces that hold plant human interactions include uh, streets. We have uh, quite a lot of number of subtropical and temperate species planted along our streets and also different parks, such as the Citadella Park, where many people go and have fun uh, in the lake, and they also walk through the forest, etc. Another space that I'm really interested in is these peri-urban spaces, and spaces where rural and urban uh, get connected, because really interesting phenomena occur in these spaces. So if we go to another really interesting space where many human nature interactions occur are markets, and especially markets that host both local and foreign plants, or exotic plants, as we call them, because they weren't common in, in the past in Barcelona. Olives, for example, is a case 
of a plant that has been for, for several centuries around, even millennia. But if we go, for example, for this post on chili peppers, it's a more recent uh, plant in our culture after the Spanish conquest of America, but it's already a plant that we use in our diet. But if we will go, for example, into this example, the celtus, this is a, a type of lettuce, although it looks like a celery or something, asparagus. This is a lettuce, and this lettuce is uh, mostly eaten by Chinese population. So usually a person from Barcelona wouldn't know what this plant is, and these plants are starting to arrive to our market. So this is kind of like the, the things we're trying to analyze, which plants are arriving, how they are used, who uses them, etc. So amongst this work related with food plants and immigrants, we have created a, an urban biocultural network in a town called Santa Coloma de Gramanet next to Barcelona in the peri-urban area of Barcelona, where we have been doing ethnoculinary research. We have also uh, promoted communal activities where food is a central part. We have disseminated most of our research also, and we have created several outreach materials for people to learn about these plants, how they are cooked, how they are called, because even sometimes the names are only written in a foreign language and people don't know what they are eating, or the seller doesn't know how it's called in Spanish. So these materials help people to communicate better around plants. So as you know, this is a representation or a theoretical framework that kind of represents all these aspects I was talking about, from cities as ecosystems and biocultural landscapes, to food plants as, uh, and food as a universal language, and also this combination of natural and cultural resources that constitute this network that we are uh, starting to create, or that already existed, but we are promoting and studying in uh, deeper detail. So to finish and to kind of like uh, think about what's missing in most of the things that I was looking about eco cities and smart cities is actually this nature culture relation. Usually if we see, for example, or if we look for green cities or eco cities, we have that picture number one where humans are on one side, plants are on the other, but there is no interaction between them. Or if we look at smart cities and you look in the pictures that you find on the internet, you get this image about computers or cell phones or buildings that are smart and that control light, and, but there is no interaction with nature. Even in green urbanism, both sides, social cultural features and biodiversity are apart instead of being one unit. So what I propose is this vision of uh, cities where really people and animals and plants interact together. And like this, there is all this exchange of knowledge and also of time together. So just as a metaphor of uh, this circularity that uh, abounds everywhere in nature, and also thinking of how artists also can uh, bring to science also new thought is this idea of circles that are disconnected, some are connected, some get connected through different lines, and this idea of circles within circle, which kind of represents also uh, the work that I'm doing. So, merci. Thank you. <laughs>